Welcome to Badger Claw. Badger Claw. It's untenable. That's all there is to it. You asked to see me? Yes, Mr. Joe. Please have a seat. I think I'll be given the orders. Use our prisoner. We'll stand if you like. It makes little difference to me. I know you carry shrapnel in your leg, but if you choose personal discomfort for the sake of authoritarian posturing, then that's your own choice. Though I'm certain its constant throbbing must be vexing, and you'd likely be more concentrated were you to sit, not to mention more amiable. But, as you like it, it's your choice. It ain't that vexing. Yes, yes, I'm sure you're quite brawny and stalwart, and I would never dream of impugning your toughness and manhood. Now, I have a few things I wish to discuss with you. I'm sure you do. I see you as occupying the position of Commandant of this camp, though it is my understanding that full authority is divided between yourself and one Mr. Harry, though his duties seem to lie more in the strategic and oversight capacity, while your own is administrative in nature. Therefore, it is to you with whom I've requested to speak. Am I correct in this assessment? I reckon. Now then, there are a few matters of urgency of which we must parlay. Without paper or pen, I'm forced to rely solely on memory to call forth these matters, so you'll forgive me if pause or stammer oversalts my discourse. Sure. First of all, we must address the subterfuge by which you've executed my capture. You'll be relieved to know I hold this not against you, and that the very nature of the enterprise being necessarily dishonest, I do not count it any further to your deficit the deception through which you made your business, and I myself, as you know, employed the same device to my own ends as well. My adoption of the alias Sally Jones precludes judgment on your pretension of being one Lionel Abernathy. Consider the issue in pari delicto. All right, I'm going to sit down. Not because you wanted me to. I just want to see if this chair is up to snuff. Now, as for my abduction itself, there's little to say about it that would alter, alleviate, or redress the matter. You are obviously a man chosen of sin and criminality, and there would be little <laughs> use in appealing to conscience, and even less so to law. <laughs> As to my imprisonment, however, I believe we can here find some common ground as to my accommodations, until the situation has been resolved. Huh. How's that? First, I must say that I have not been harmed, other than minor nicks and bruises, but I again find this natural and within the norms of the crime already undertaken. I have not been unreasonably restrained, though my wrists remain tied. I have been fed and provided shelter, and have not been, as yet, unduly harmed by any in your employ, though threats to the contrary have been frequent. It seems to me that my own standard of living while imprisoned has not been much more lowly than that of those who imprison me. For that I am grateful. But you must, as Commandant, feel some shame in this. As from another perspective, it could be said that your laborers are, under your supervision, afforded only a slightly better accommodated lifestyle than that of a prisoner. Shame? Your employees, to a man, are soiled, underclothed, and unkempt. Granted, this may be the norm of Western criminal culture, but still... It is hardly acceptable, and certainly unnecessary. Why, this camp has all the facilities and labor required to provide basic laundry and grooming services. Yet your men sit idle, left to wallow in their filth. There is no lack of access to fresh water, for I have seen the creek myself that runs through the middle of this hideaway. There simply is no excuse for your men to be so sloven, as you must recognize, as a former military man, that slovenliness is the quickest and surest route to insubordination. <sighs> Further, sanitation concerns aside... It is widely understood in modern times that a prisoner has a reasonable right to exercise, and though it is true that I have paced my way around this cabin many times over, this is hardly enough to render this right. Therefore, as your camp clearly has need, and the operation of my own rights might oblige them, I suggest the compromise be made that I take as my occupation, to keep my mind sound and body of health, the assuagement of the unseemly situation pertaining to your ragged men, for whatever duration, until the ransom situation has been resolved." What you have in mind, exactly? It would be little trouble for me to help your employees to a better grooming, befitting the dignity of God's noblest creature, even those with souls debased by moral degeneracy. <laughs> your men, each one of them, is in desperate need of shaving, a haircut, and a mending and thorough cleaning oh. of what we'll generously call clothing. You want me to give you a razor blade and scissors? Don't you think that'd be a little unwise to bestow upon a prisoner? I'd be heavily supervised, of course, but beyond that, no, that is not the scope of my ambition. Mm. I consider hygiene a human right and find your leadership in this regard lacking. Well, hey now. My objective goes beyond merely cutting hair and mending clothes. These are simple tasks that your men ought, by right, to be able to do for themselves, and I would consider it within the scope of my mission to educate and equip them to do so. After all, I do not expect to be acquainted here for long. You want to turn them into a bunch of preening sissies is what it sounds like. 
One might argue that it is the man or boy dependent upon a woman or some other authority to do for him that which he ought to be able to do for himself that is the sissy. The independent man is no sissy. Oh. Well, that is a compelling argument. I'll give you that. Further, I've heard through these walls often the faint sound of the fiddle, played amateurishly and out of tune. I can help with that as well, if you'd like. The fiddle? Now, as for your friend and co-conspirator, Mr. Harry... I mean... I oh, know. I don't know what can be done, but something must be. It's bad. You're right. He looks like a girl's doll that has been made the toy of a cat. I oh, know. I oh, know. I once dropped a gingerbread onto the stove and had to pry it loose with a spatula and castor oil. And even my dog Beowulf would not eat it. And yet it more resembled the human form than that odious creature. Yeah. I wish not to belabor the point, but are you sure he's of human lineage? Yeah, Both he's parents? fully human. I'm pretty sure of it. I had hitherto always considered the existence of succubi and hobgoblins as medieval superstitions, but I'm lately reassessing that assumption. No, he's fine. It's fine. Which brings me to my last point. Oh, good. While, as I've said, the nature of your chosen career and the state and fate of your own soul are beyond the scope of my judicature, Thank you. as it is the essence of evil, epizootic and audacious, it is by sequence immutable that you shall make effort to spread your villainy, even to those who had hitherto been innocent and unsuspecting, just as a parasite finds harbor amongst a host, with tragic potential to transmit from one to another, with exponential virality. It is therefore incumbent upon the fallen man to restrain himself in his wickedness, not only in the selection of his victims, to whom he can only do bodily harm, but even more so in the adoption of his apprentices. In what state these other men might have been before falling under your tutelage, I cannot know. But, Mr. Joe, hear me when I say with all contempt, disgust, and outrage that I, with all my being, denounce, rebuke, and assail your inclusion of poor Lionel Habernathy and Jesse Gooseplucker in your evil schemes. How dare you, sir? You snake! Mm. You warthog! You virus! Mm. For shame! For shame, sir. Well, that ain't a nice thing to say. Whatever may become of me, if you don't leave those two men alone and free them of your insidious influence, I swear by the blood in my veins that you will pay with your very being for every ounce of innocence, kindness, and decency you dare to sap from theirs a thousand times over, with interest until to the devil himself will you plead for mercy and find none. For in him there is none, and shall in you be none, if you do not this day repent. Smokes, that seems harsh. Yes. Well, you know they came to me. And I to them. And no longer shall they be yours to manipulate. I reckon we'll see about that. Anything else that's on your mind? Yes. I'd like a hairbrush. For myself. It's not urgent, but now that I'm missing a piece of it, I'm feeling a bit unsullied. And also a ribbon. Where is this blasted fort? There's a good girl. Good girl. Keep your pace steady now. We'll be upon water soon enough. We're descending again, I think. Blimey, I should have known better than to trust an army map. There must be some sign. Tracks in the field. Smoke in the sky. Something. Oh, Willie, keep yourself safe. Give them no gruff. Hold steady and be brave. We'll be coming for you soon. We'll come for you, I promise you. Just you hold on. 